Dragon's Dogma 2 has been an absolute nightmare to work on. Check this out. That's what happens when the game tries to render, i.e. play. Also, we had uh, multiple accounts get locked out because you get five hardware changes in a 24-hour period, and then that's it. Cuts you off, it eventually cycles through, and that is thanks to what's known as bullshit. DRM. We had a solution though. We bought four copies of this game. There's other complaints too, like it has a singular save slot, which makes things annoying to benchmark, but also just is really terrible from a playing the game perspective. Uh, we struggled to transplant save files between Steam accounts, despite it being basically a single player game. And ultimately what we did was buy multiple copies, play through to the same point on all those copies. So some of the team got paid to speed run Dragon's Dogma 2 to the first city uh, the past couple days. And it was a full team effort. This is, in some ways it's archaic, but we're not here to critique the systems of Dragma, Dragma, Dragma's Dogma 2. Uh, we are instead here to talk about the performance, and there's a lot to talk about with this. The game is somewhat of a nightmare in that aspect, too. Fortunately for us, that gives us a great opportunity to show this, which is the freshly updated GPU Busy plus the new GPU weight and the CPU Busy and CPU weight metrics that allow us to pinpoint bottlenecks precisely, even in times of uncertainty. Uh, we'll look at all that today, plus some research. We have ultimately a CPU benchmark with a list of about that was 20 or so CPUs on it. And we would have done more, but because of the five device activation limit, that's what we get and they need time to update it anyway. Uh, but at least they got 280 bucks out of us for this video. So you can go over to store.cameraxis.net if you want to help fund our purchasing of games that have activation limits. So go grab a GN 3D Metal Emblem pint glass on the GN store and pour one out for our nearly $300 while supporting our content. For this video though, I'm personally the most excited about playing around with the new GPU Busy and GPU Weight metrics. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Tower 300. The Tower 300 is a full-on showcase PC case built to present the computer straight on with its angled tempered glass windows or on a unique mounting stand to show off the build in new ways. The Tower 300 has a layout that positions the GPU fans against the mesh panel with ventilation on the opposite side for liquid coolers and CPUs. There's also an included two 140mm fans up top. The panels use a quick access toolless system to be quickly popped in and out for maintenance, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. This is doing a lot of stuff in the background on the CPU, uh, with the NPCs, this is something that the developers have actually pointed out in their recent pseudo-apology update post because they're getting destroyed on Steam reviews right now. Now, a few of the issues we encountered with Dragon's Dogma 2 included unpredictable game crashes, but then more predictable ones as well on lower VRAM cards like the 4060. We also noticed micro stutter and simulation time error wherein the frames would appear to be relatively fluid, even if you look at frame times, but the animation within the frame was improperly timed. Other issues include wildly variable performance depending on the area of the game. So unlike most games, it'll switch from a hard CPU bind, say in the city, to a hard GPU bind in wilderness areas. Most games are more balanced in one area and might be hard bound in another, or they have a soft bind in one area and a hard bind in another. And in this instance, hard versus soft bind refers to sort of what percentage of the total frame render time each component is waiting for the other. The game is already ranked overwhelmingly negative as a result of performance issues, game crashing, and DLC, and the performance issues alone leave us in the usual state of absolute and utter bewilderment at why these game companies keep doing this to themselves. Surely they knew about this before uh, launch, but here we are doing it again. Uh, there may be some optimization they can do here. They seem to suggest that that's in the cards, but anyway, we'll just get straight into it. We'll start with the research, get through some of the charts and the CPU benchmarks. Then we're gonna look at those new metrics as an overlay on top of gameplay. This section will show you some of the research that went into finding a test area. This is conducted by actually playing the game and taking frame time samples during the course of play. We take these manually and we assign names to each sample. Here's the result. This was done with an overclocked i7 CPU and an RTX 4090 at 4K. In every single game we test, except Baldur's Gate, 4K is enough to shift the load entirely to the GPU and avoid a CPU bind. That was true in many instances for this game also. 
But in the city, even at 4K, it was shockingly not enough to overcome CPU limitations, even with our overclock. We'll talk about the 7800X3D and the 14900K results next. Overall though, this is what we saw across 90 minutes of gameplay. The range in this game is huge, with a max minus min result of about 91 FPS here. That's massive. That range is the size of a whole different GPU on its own, and it's a huge swing across different areas of the game. In the wilderness areas, we were in the range of 120 to 170 FPS average, and we were GPU bound in those scenarios, which will prove momentarily with some captured gameplay. Combat did not have a heavy impact on performance unless high counts of NPCs were involved. The towns were the heaviest though, down in the 70s to 80s for our Vernworth passes, and in the 98 range for the smaller town, Melv. The first camp was also around 98 FPS average. The common factor was the presence of NPCs. After all this work and still set on doing a GPU benchmark, we settled on the highest load area for the game as we'd prefer to represent something closer to a worst case scenario to give people headroom for figuring out what they need. Unfortunately, at the time, we didn't yet appreciate just how CPU bound this scenario was. Here's the first round of GPU benchmark results. As soon as we observed the 4090 yielded the same performance as a 4070 Ti Super, we knew that GPU benchmarking would be pointless. At least it would be in this area. And this, by the way, was on the 4900K at 5.9 gigahertz. So we had already switched CPUs to something higher end. Even switching to the 7800XPD, which was a major time commitment to set up a whole new touch bench, yielded the same result as the 4900K. And this was all at 4K, so we gave it as heavy a bind as we could. In this set of tests, the 4070 Ti and the 4090 performed the same. 78X3D didn't change that, uh, but it's not because of a GPU bind, even though we're at 4K here and we're seeing similar performance. The 4060 dipped, but this just isn't enough range to produce meaningful GPU comparison benchmarks without testing in a field instead of a city, which we could do, but it'd be less demanding as an area of the game, and we want to investigate this behavior. After this, we moved on and decided to make this video a CPU benchmark instead. So let's do those charts next, and then we'll come back and look at some really interesting information with GPU busy, GPU weight, CPU busy, and CPU weight, and we'll talk about some of the simulation time error problems we observed. So here's the results of the 4090. When everything is stock, the 78X3D leads the chart at 86 FPS average, but the game still feels terrible to play at times, with simulation time error clearly appearing in animation. This is a metric that we're still working on. We have an interview with Tom Peterson talking about this some more. The i9-14900K is about the same level here, running at 83 to 84 FPS average when CPU bound. That has the 7800X3D as much as 3% ahead of the 14900K. It's not enough to matter. The 12100F has historically been one of the best ultra-budget gaming CPUs, but it occasionally shows hard limitations. This is one of those times. The frame times are actually a lot worse than shown here, as averaging multiple test passes is hiding the horrible stutter in the first pass. We'll come back to that and look at it in a moment. We would consider the 12100F unplayable for this game. There's really nothing you can do. We tried tweaking the settings, we dropped everything to the lowest possible. Doesn't matter, all the settings are basically graphics intensive, so it didn't help here. The 5600X exhibited similar behavior, averaged over multiple passes, it does okay, but the first time through an area it brought its 0.1% lows down to about 6 FPS for that metric, indicating large frame time spikes. Other points of interest include the 5800X3D versus the 5800X, where we see a 16.5% benefit from the 3D cache. The 7950X was unable to leverage its additional cores in a meaningful way in this one. There's a point of diminishing returns, and it's past that point. Higher frequency would be more helpful here than going to the extreme core account of a 7950X. Let's move on to the frame time. Here it is. This is the insanely blown out frame time plot from our first run on the 12100F where we first hit an area of the city that must have begun some heavier background calculations to the extent that we thought the game actually crashed, which it also has done a lot, when this happened. So what this means is that the threads of the CPU are fully occupied processing in the background and none of those threads are handling the actual rendering and presentation of the frames to the screen. Instead, they're doing other things. For perspective, that looks like this, what you're seeing right now. If we zoom the scale in to see the rest, we still had to raise the roof to 800 milliseconds to accommodate the next two largest spikes. For reference, at 60 FPS, one frame is about 16.7 milliseconds to present. 
an excursion of 8 to 12 milliseconds is noticeable. And here we have excursions of about 750 milliseconds in one instance. The game freezes up hard and it rests at times on the 12100F. Even the newer and better 5600X occasionally hits these problems. In this plot, you can see we have a frame time spike nearing 270 milliseconds with regular spikes to 60 milliseconds. In fact, every time we pivoted the camera left and right, which is part of our benchmark course, we saw this sort of micro stutter in animation of the main character at best. Uh, or just actual playback stutters of the entire frame at worst. Now we're moving on to the really fun part that I'm excited about. This is game capture while using GPU busy, CPU busy, GPU and CPU wait to illustrate bottlenecks. The bottleneck is a moving target in this game, which makes this perfect for this new testing, and it shifts between the CPU and the GPU depending on the area tested. This is expanded from the past GPU busy benchmarks we did, because now we have that wait metric, and that's all explained in a separate a deep dive engineering piece that will link below. You should definitely check it out if you don't understand what it is. Won't go into it here, but it's really cool and it gives us some new insights. In the city, tested at 4K with a 4090 and a 4900K, we observed CPU busy functionally at parity with frame time, which means the GPU is waiting instructions and can't be fully leveraged. We see this also in our GPU and CPU wait metrics, where GPU wait is often in the four to six millisecond range while CPU wait is basically zero. We're completely limited by the CPU, even at 4K and high settings. You can also see this in the GPU power metrics histogram, where the GPU is under its power target. Click to photons, about eight milliseconds here, which is acceptable. CPU utilization is not useful in this plot, but it's here because it's a great learning lesson for the many who rely on this single number for this measurement, because if you hear us talking about being CPU bound this whole time, but you're staring at that 30% number going, no, you're not, that is uh, not really a useful number. So here's why. If you were to check hardware info or task manager even, which also isn't great, the latter, uh, you'd see that at least eight cores and sometimes up to 12 are 100% loaded by the game. The remainder of the cores go largely underutilized, which contributes to the total utilization percentage being lower because it's averaging across the entire CPU and also not all load is the same uh, as calculated here. So we are in fact completely CPU bound, even though that number is not showing 100%. That's why that number is basically useless in most instances. Daytime is similarly constrained to nighttime. We're close to parity on the CPU and the frame time total metric, which means that we are CPU limited. Moving to other areas of the game upon exiting the city, you see the load shift somewhat rapidly to the GPU as soon as we're outside of bounds of where it's processing all the AI for the city. You can see the frame rate climb overall, which means the frame time is reducing, and now the CPU and GPU busy metrics are closer to parity with frame time to actually balancing out here. And the further away from the city we go, the more the load shifts to an entirely GPU bound situation. Power consumption has also climbed to more expected numbers. In combat, load moves around and occasionally triggers a CPU bind, but generally it's GPU constraint. Click to photon trends closer to 12 milliseconds at time, still fine. And you can also see a CPU load climb disproportionately to the GPU load as the Griffin makes its way into the water, which we were appreciative of. We can't be sure if something else happened in the background. Maybe this is from the pathfinding, but it could be from other NPC calculations. You can see another big spike in CPU load as we get a level up and the camera pans back toward the village and the town. On return, passing the ox cart and re-entering the town confirms what we knew. The GPU is now reducing its load and it is no longer fully loaded. It wants to be, but the CPU can't keep up. It's not able to send enough tasks to the GPU. The CPU is busy getting hammered by the AI processing for the NPCs. The takeaway is that for testing in this game, uh, our options are these. If we wanted to test a worst case scenario period, we'd go to the city. If we wanted to test a CPU scenario, it'd be the city. And if we or other reviewers wanted to evaluate GPU performance in as isolated a way as possible, it'd make the most sense to do so outside of the city, ideally in a field with a lot of grass and increased grass quality, as that had a hard impact on performance. We noticed some animation micro stutter with high grass quality as well. And as our earlier research chart showed, it didn't really matter whether we were in combat or not. You just find one of the heavier outdoors areas with a lot of polygons and geometry, and hopefully basically zero NPCs, and that becomes the GPU load. But this was all at 4K, and so that scaling would be reduced at lower resolutions.
So this game is definitely CPU heavy, and it's actually kind of interesting for us because in a lot of situations with games, they just don't load that many threads that heavily. And in this one, we're seeing significant, like 100% load on multiple threads. It's not a single threaded title like you see with some of Valve's, for example, like in the past, Dota 2, I haven't tested it recently, uh, CSGO before it was phased out, things like that. This is on multiple threads, and we see that, again, manifest like with the 12100F, but it is uh, CPU bound in such a way as to bring the game to a crawl. It just seems like there has to be something more that can be done there, uh, especially since they've kind of already hinted at that being something they're working on, the developers, that is. The load is heaviest in towns, outposts, basically villages, and the city itself. The city is the heaviest of those. However, a town or a village or an outpost, whatever you want to, the, the first outpost is very similar in performance to some of the city performance later on in the game. So uh, in the plains and wilderness and most combat scenarios, if they're outside of a city, then uh, the performance goes up significantly. It starts to become a GPU bind, at least with something like a 4090 uh, at 4K. But if you're not at a higher resolution uh, and you're on a higher end card, then you might still be kind of in the middle, more balanced between CPU and GPU load. The good news, is if you want to improve the performance in the city, there is a way to do it. You can kill everyone, kind of like in the Elder Scrolls. That's going to get me on a list. It is wild, though, to see the performance vary so much, because you'll get as much as a 30% bump just by walking out the gate of the city into the immediate outlying area. It can double in other areas, too. So uh, depending on what device combination you have, there is a wide range of performance. This means that, for the most part, the game can remain playable and higher frame rate in situations where higher frame rate matters the most, like combat in the wild. So that's a good thing. It also means that if you are GPU heavy, meaning your GPU is maybe your highest invested part in the build, like is the case for most people, and you find yourself being largely CPU constrained here, you can kind of blast all those settings. They're not really gonna hurt the performance in those city and outpost areas. You'll start seeing it maybe in uh, wilderness and combat, but the frame rate also boosts there, so you'd probably get away with it. At least we could with the test setup we were using for most of this. So then for things like the 12100F, the 5600X, we suspect that being more limited in core count like four on the 12100F means that there aren't enough threads available to task everything. So between the scheduling of the engine and what cores are available, we think it's maybe dropping the render thread in favor of whatever else, NPC tracking, pathfinding, physics, game state, whatever's going on in the background, AI, uh, and once an area is loaded, it's much more reliable. But loading those areas can freeze the game and put it on the verge of crashing or just straight up crash it. The 5600X wasn't nearly as bad, but we still ran into occasional 250 to 300 millisecond spikes in those scenarios. I will say it was cool seeing the game load six to eight threads pretty reliably at 100% when they were available, going up to 12 uh, in some instances. The VRAM can also be heavy, but for the most part, unless you're manually maxing out some of those settings beyond what the default high profile does, uh, you're more likely to be CPU bound first than anything. That's all with brand new drivers, by the way. So all that NVIDIA testing in this video was done with the newest driver that does support officially Dragon's Dogma 2. We did some RT testing too, it was really lightweight. Uh, so just for the test, I mean, so we saw about a 10 FPS swing from about 72 to about 80 something, 82, 84. Uh, when we did that on off test in the city didn't go hunting for a bunch of ray tracing comparisons and things like that because the focus again became cpus but we did collect some of that data that's the answer for you makes it a little more gpu heavy but it wasn't crazy this might be a game though where overclocking actually poses some value uh, especially if you're on an older device where there was more readily available headroom for boosting the performance. So that's it for this one. It was it was kind of fun to benchmark because we got to use all these new tools, see cool things in the results. But the Steam reviews talking about performance, uh, they're grounded in reality, uh, objectively. So definitely one of the heaviest games we've benchmarked and sadly one of the worst we've tested in the last year with regard to things like instability, uh, crashing, and just kind of generally unpredictable performance at times. So um, hopefully they fix it, but this seems to, for whatever reason, be the, the default way that games ship now.
a uh, couple exemptions like Baldur's Gate 3. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Support us, as always, on store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to throw a few bucks our way and cover that $280. Of, I don't know what I'm going to do with these four accounts now. Um, anyway, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.